Good afternoon once again to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to sharing some things with you in the following moments that I think are really important for us at this point in our city's history. I want to start by thanking the Fresno Area Chamber of Commerce, Al Smith, the CEO, Matt Rosenfeld, the board chair, the board of directors. Thank you for convening us every year and giving us the opportunity as a community to reflect on the past year and also make plans and refocus and repurpose ourselves for the coming year. It is an important tradition in our community and one that I'm very grateful to the chamber for maintaining. I also want to recognize and uh, say a special thank you to my family members who are here. Of course, my husband, Paul, who knew a sports guy could pray, too. It's pretty crazy. I'm very fortunate and blessed to be married to Paul. Uh, and uh, he's an incredible father and an incredible husband and support to me in this job. My mom is here, Ruth Ann Newton. My dad is out of town today. It's really difficult for him not to be here. Uh, but by my mom's side, my brother-in-law, Todd Sobrato, is here. To all of my family members and those who are not here and those who are, I just want to say a special thank you for your contributions to my life and thank you for your support in this job as well. I want to say a special th thank you and recognize the members of the city family who are here today. Of course, our council members who have already been recognized and those who couldn't join us. I say it every year and I only say it because it's true. So in future years, if I come to a state of the city and I don't say that, that this, then this is your cue that something has changed. But I'm going to say it this year because it is still true. We work with a really wonderful city council. Now imagine the city of Fresno, reflect back on our history in Fresno and think, could you 20 years ago have imagined that the strong mayor of Fresno would have said about her city council that it's a great group to work with? And yet it's true. So I want to say a special thank you to my council colleagues who are every bit as diligent and committed as I am, uh, who certainly help balance me out when I need it, who are a great support, and who challenge me uh, in, at times in, in all of the appropriate and perfect ways. So thank you to our council members. I also want to recognize our city manager's office, our city manager, Mark Scott, our assistant city managers, Bruce Rudd, Renee Smith, um, these folks are the incredible, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you all the things they have on their shoulders. And there are three of them, just three for a city of 505,000 people. Mark Scott has been our planning director, our interim finance director at times. Uh, I mean, he's literally gone out to check on barking dog complaints in neighborhoods as well as leading a city and an organization of, uh, now of thousands of employees and keeping us all on track. So we're very grateful for Mark and his team and all the work that they do. I also want to recognize other city employees who are here. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you're an employee of the city of Fresno, would you just please stand so that we can recognize you for your commitment to our community? <laughs> really, really grateful for all of you. And I know that um, we're in a tough time and that a lot of what you hear in this day and age is all about the tug of wars between budget cuts and that sort of thing. But you need to know how really grateful all of us are in the community for the work that you do each and every day. I certainly couldn't do what I do without the capable, talented, fun-loving, energetic, enthusiastic, sometimes mean when they need to be, but overall just incredibly competent team of people that I get to work with in my office. And I want to recognize Georgianne White, Kelly Furtado, Katie Stevens, Mike Lukens, Cheryl Burns, Janine Cervantes, and Sean Edwards, the staff in the mayor's office. And then, of course, uh, it is a great pleasure to every year pay special tribute to the men and women of the police department and the fire department in the city of Fresno. It is something that is not heard often enough, but I want to recognize the Fresno Police Department, our Fresno Police Chief, who is literally a chief among chiefs. He is one of the best in the nation. We're grateful that he continues to serve the city of Fresno. Uh, and I just want to say a special thank you to Police Chief Jerry Dyer.
He is backed up by very capable, committed, dedicated leaders, managers, rank and file police officers. And again, I just want to say, I know there's a lot of back and forth in the paper about the, the uh, budget issues that we struggle with at the city of Fresno, but today is an important time to just recognize the work that our police officers do for our community. And uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. And lastly, I want to recognize a very, very special group of people who serve the city of Fresno every single day. There aren't all that many of them left, which is a problem. They are our firefighters. The Fresno Fire Department is literally referred to in California as being the hardest working fire department in the state. And that claim is backed up by this. No other major city in the United States has the call load that we have in the city of Fresno with as few on-duty personnel. Even so, our city has far fewer fire fatalities, and that's due to the dedication and the aggressive fire and rescue tactics we employ. So please join me in recognizing our fire department, our fire chief, Rob Brown, and the members of the Fresno Fire Department. One of the best things about this job has been getting to know the uh, folks in the fire department and seeing how committed they are to our community. It's now my distinct honor to bring to you the 2013 State of the City Address. This is perhaps an unenviable task this year because there is so much happening in our community. It's virtually impossible to capture it all, but I'll give it my best shot. Last year, I reminded you that we are a city with a big vision that there is heroic work underway to achieve that vision, that we have early signs of success, but there's still a long way to go and financial troubles yet to survive. I told you that the state of our city would depend on you, that it would depend on me, and on whether or not we chose as a community to stay strong, and whether or not we chose stamina as a community, sometimes in the throes of exhaustion. And that ultimately the state of our city depends on whether or not we collectively choose to not give up. Well, looking back over the last year, I say with confidence that our community has in fact chosen determination and persistence in the face of challenges. And for that reason, Fresno, I tell you that the state of your city remains strong. You're going to believe me by the end of this speech, by the way. <laughs> You're just getting warmed up, I know. For the next 30 minutes or so, and yes, Jim Boren, I did say 30 minutes, it's my hope that you will see what I see. I have a unique vantage point in that I get to see the opportunities across our community. I see the wins that are happening. And of course, I see the challenges, I see the failures, but above all else, I see people and businesses and neighborhoods and schools and community organizations who have put in the effort. They have prepared themselves, they've trained for this moment, and now they are swinging for the fences on behalf of our city. I'm not talking about wild-eyed, unrealistic hacks at the ball. I'm talking about Buster Posey, Pablo Sandoval kinds of swings, confident swings at the ball. Our community is at bat. We're prepared, we're determined, and we're swinging for the fences. Pardon my baseball references, but it's always baseball season when I give State of the City address, and so somehow baseball finds its way into every speech. Well, today I want to talk about where I see this the most, jobs, neighborhoods, and yes, of course, downtown. So let's talk first about jobs. This is our community's most important issue, and it's my favorite subject. For the last three years, you've been hearing me talk about the importance of growing our exporting industrial businesses, and that the most immediate opportunities to create jobs, lower unemployment, and increase income levels in Fresno is by supporting the expansion of these exporters. And given that we live in the food capital of the world, the most likely target for industrial expansion is in the food industry. We grow and make the finest food products in the world. No debate, end of conversation. 
So we started this thing called the Fresno Food Expo to create an opportunity for food businesses of all sizes in the Fresno region to try to sell more of their products to local, regional, national, and international customers for this simple reason. If our local businesses sell more stuff to their customers, then they add jobs to our community. See, that's how that works. Well, I don't know how many of you were able to attend, but if you did, you saw what I saw, and that is the 2013 Fresno Food Expo was a major home run. We welcomed 640 buyers this year, including 25 from China, Canada, and Mexico, and that's up from just 430 buyers the year before. Over 1,100 people filled this room and the one next to us during the public portion of the show that night of the expo. We had 103 businesses exhibiting their products, everything from spicy chocolate-covered raisins to a new hot peanut sauce, almond-flavored water, root beer-flavored milk, and yes, cake batter-flavored vodka. What else will they think of next? <laughs> of those exhibitors, 75% said that they expect an increase in sales as a direct result of their participation in the show. And 60% of them said that they were able to meet, on average, eight great new buyer contacts that they would not otherwise have met. Now, one of the businesses that exhibited at this last year's show was PDQ, the maker of the most delicious Brazilian cheesy bread that you've ever tasted. Flavia Flores, the founder of PDQ, launched her business at the first Fresno Food Expo in 2011, and I think she was in the back handing out samples when you came in today, so you know how delicious her product is. Well, she started her business just two years ago using the Food Expo as the launch pad for her business. A year later, she opened her own retail storefront at Echo and Weldon just across from Fresno High. So she has a retail operation on the front side of her building, and she's able to manufacture her product on the back side of her building. Well, at this year's Food Expo, Flavia was introduced to Costco buyers, who then invited her to do her first road show this last weekend at the River Park Costco. She was tasked with selling 1,300 jars from Thursday to Sunday. On Sunday at 2 o'clock, PDQ officially sold out of their product and left a line of people wrapped around the store waiting for even more PDQs. As a result of that great, great event this weekend, Flavia was officially invited to Costco's corporate offices for what they call future planning, which means they're trying to figure out how they can get her product onto the shelves of more of their stores. Congratulations to Flavia and PDQ. There are other great success stories from this year's Food Expo, like Bella Viva Orchards, who participated in our show for the first time. Now, before attending the show, Bella Viva only sold products at local farmers markets and a few select restaurants and to some online customers. Well, at this year's show, Bella Viva won the New Product Industry Award, and they've now been approached by Safeway, Whole Foods, and Trader Joe's about selling her products in their stores. Great expansion opportunity for Bella Viva Orchards. Now, the Food Expo is not the only thing that we've been doing to try to attract and expand businesses in Fresno. You may remember last year at the State of the City Address, we launched a great website called fresnofood.org. That tells the Fresno food story and why we are the best location on the West Coast for food-related business activity. And the response to that site has been terrific. Here's a great example of that. Last October, I was at home one Monday night with my family. It's October 22nd to be exact. We just finished dinner and uh, I happen to be a little bit of an addict when it comes to checking my email. So of course, I'm sitting there checking my email. At 6.48 p.m., I get an email from this person named Hazel, from a company called The Pressed Juicery. And the email said this, Hi, Mayor Swearingen. I found your email address on fresnofood.org. We're looking to move our facility to Fresno as we're outgrowing our current facility in Los Angeles quickly, and we have plans for major expansion. If you can provide us with the resources to start off on the right foot and have time to meet with the leaders of our company this week, that would be great. We're ready to start scouring for property. Please feel free to call me at the office at blah, blah, blah number. 
Now, I read this email and I did a double take and I'm thinking, is this a hoax? Is this a, if you'll just send me money, I'll be able to get out of jail and get back home? <laughs> and so I quickly looked up Press Juicery and I was like, gosh, this company is for real. So I, of course, responded to the email. And then within a few minutes, Amy Huerta, our local business initiatives manager, starts emailing me and Mark Scott and Craig. And she's getting emails from a different person in the company, uh, from the COO. And long story short, all of this was happening on a Monday night. By Thursday morning, we're having breakfast at the Patio Cafe in Fig Garden Village with the COO of the company, Craig is there, Amy's there, I'm there. In just three short days, all off of this website. And we're talking to Press Juicery about why they ought to move their business out of LA and into Fresno. What we learned that morning at the Patio Cafe is that Press Juicery is a relatively young firm, started in 2010. It's a very high growth company, venture capital backed, and it's the producer of very, very high end juice products. In fact, every bottle of juice they sell has five pounds of fruits and veggies in it, and yet it tastes delicious. When we sat down for breakfast that Thursday morning, of course, Eugene, being the good spokesperson for his company, brings in boxes and boxes of his products, and he starts putting them on the table. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I'm looking at these bottles that have literally look like green seaweed, liquid seaweed in them, and I'm thinking, they're going to make me drink that. <laughs> And I don't want to drink it. It looks terrible. But I want this company to move here. So Craig and I are thinking the same thing. We're like, oh. So Eugene pours it in a glass. It's very th five pounds of fruits and vegetables. Very thick. Pours it in. And so I kind of do one of these. And it was absolutely delicious. I don't know how they do it. I would not normally want to consume five pounds of vegetables in one sitting. But it was fantastic, much to my relief. So we learned that this firm started with just 4,000 square feet of retail space in West LA. They now operate a total of seven retail locations in LA and three in San Francisco with a total of 200 employees. So Amy scrambles and sets up a great day of meetings for the press juicery team. They met with real estate people, meet, uh, suppliers of all of the products they're going to need to manufacture here in Fresno, other food industry leaders. And that began a six-month process of working with press juicery to get their production facility moved out of L.A. and into Fresno. Well, just a few weeks ago, we learned that a lease has been signed and that Press Juicery is officially moving to Fresno. Why Fresno? We know the answer to that question, but let's listen to what Press Juicery has to say. They say that by moving to Fresno, we're able to better, better serve our customers while maintaining and even increasing our standards of quality, all while minimizing our carbon footprint offering a better product because we'll source locally and have access to produce picked fresh from the farm, optimizing flavor and nutrients. And we'll be able to provide better service because we're now equidistant to both San Francisco and LA. And instead of having to ship everything from LA, we can ship it right from Fresno to both markets. That means a cleaner footprint and products being picked right from the farm and going directly into production in our Fresno facility and then directly into our stores. They say we are proud and excited to be in Fresno. I want you to meet some of their representatives who are here today. I'm going to ask Retna Terakul Satit and Amil Gupta, would you please stand and be recognized. Let's give them a warm Fresno welcome. So there's even more to this really cool story. It gets even better. So it turns out the facility on Church Avenue that's just perfect for press juicery already was occupied by a portion of another local food company's operations. And that local food company is Fiore de Pasta. Now, Fiore de Pasta manufactures over a million pounds of pasta per week. Now, that I can eat. <laughs> Fior de Pasta was also at the Food Expo. In case you had a chance to sample their pastas, they make the most incredible mushroom risotto. You can make it right in your microwave. It's phenomenal. Anyway, so they make, they make pasta, but they have another facility. And when they found out that this other firm wanted to take their space on church, 
Fiore de Pasta said, well, we've actually been planning an expansion at our Jensen site. So we can move our Church Avenue operations over our Jensen site, expand there by 20,000 square feet, hire another 20 people, and this is just the first of many expansions that we have planned at this other site. Pretty awesome, right? So Press Juicery moving into their other facility created a bit of a domino effect that helped prompt another local food manufacturer to take the plunge and go ahead and expand their business as they had been planning. All of this because of this great website we launched last year. I'm telling you that things are getting good around here when it comes to industrial expansion and expanding our food business. Here's just a couple of more examples. Caro Nut Company is a new business recruit here in Fresno. They're a roaster and a packager of cashews and other assorted nuts, and they sell to large retailers and wholesalers. They were producing offshore, but one of the principals of the company lived here in the Fresno area. So the company decided that they needed to move their, domestic op uh, their offshore operations back to domestic operations. And after hearing and seeing all the excitement about food-related businesses in Fresno, they chose to look in Fresno for a facility. They signed a lease on a 75,000 square foot facility a few months ago, and they'll begin operations in the next few months, adding even more jobs to our local economy. Congratulations, Caro Nut Company. And then last fall, this has been an exciting story that we have not been able to share until now. So last fall, we found out that Kraft was looking for one of its sites to do a pretty significant plant expansion. And we found out that Fresno was in the running along with another Midwest location. Spent a lot of time talking with them, doing what we could to support and encourage the expansion in Fresno. Well, I'm pleased to tell you today that they did, in fact, pick the Fresno Craft Foods Beverages uh, over this other Midwest location for an expansion and an in installation of a new product line to make the Mio Liquid Water Enhancers. How many of you have had the Mio Liquid Water Enhancers? They're one of the top-selling items in grocery stores this last year. So in addition to the capital invested in the production line, Kraft added another 20 new jobs to help staff that line. And I have to say that having an international giant in the food industry like Kraft select Fresno over, I'll just tell you, it was Chicago, for a plant expansion is a great endorsement of our city, and it's an excellent choice for food-related businesses. So two other just quick stories. Go ahead and clap if you want. That's great. Everybody say, Mio. There you go. So two other business success stories to mention in this last year, although not food related, these are great projects. So you all probably recall a few months ago, we did a groundbreaking for FedEx. They're under construction on a new 200,000 square foot facility at North and East Avenues. And you have to ask yourself, why is FedEx expanding here? Well, it's because they're seeing a huge uptick in their clients' businesses, and they've got to ramp up to serve that business. So that is good news for all of us. And then the last job story that I want to mention, I can't tell you the name of this firm, but I did get permission from the business to tell you about their, pro their project. This company is a multinational information and technology company that will be moving into the North Point Business Center uh, in a state-of-the-art 50,000 square foot facility uh, later this summer in July. They're a huge vendor for Amazon and their goal is to be operating by the end of the fourth quarter in time for the holiday season. They're making a multi-million dollar investment in this new equipment and in their facility. To start, they'll hire 30 employees with plans to expand from there. When the representatives of this company first toured Fresno, Mark, Scott, and I had a chance to meet with them at the end of the day. They were so enthusiastic about what they found in our city. They were saying things like, Fresno is the best kept secret on the West Coast. Like, who put that there? We have never heard of Fresno. They kept saying, this is the perfect location for us to reach all of our customers on the West Coast. And they were so impressed by the responsiveness of City Hall, the local real estate community, the utility providers, AT&T, PG&E. Now, they did have one criticism about Fresno. And thankfully, it was one they were willing to overlook. And they signed the lease on the building. But the COO of the company looked at Mark and me and said, why do your freeways have so much litter? So when you hear me arguing that perhaps we should consider using local Measure C dollars for some kind of a pilot cleanup project to keep litter off our freeways, please know this is why I'm making that case.
It makes an impact on businesses we're trying to recruit here. We need the support of all the surrounding cities in Fresno and Fresno County in order to use those dollars in this fashion. I guarantee you the people who will be taking those jobs at this new facility beginning later this year will not just be from the city of Fresno. They'll be from Clovis and Selma and Sanger and Fowler and all the surrounding areas. So it really is important, not just to the big city and the county, but to the whole area that we do what it takes to keep our freeways clean. So do you agree? Great. All right, Fresno. I see us swinging for the fences on jobs and economic development, and we're starting to make contact with the ball. But that's not the only area in which our city is swinging hard and swinging for the fences. Let's talk quickly about neighborhood revitalization. You all know by now how passionate I am about seeing our older distressed neighborhoods turned around. In fact, when I drive around our city and I see deteriorated neighborhoods, instead of getting depressed, I actually get really excited because I can think to myself and I can see in my mind's eye what this neighborhood is going to be like when we're finished revitalizing it. So when I drive around our city, I get really happy because there are a lot of neighborhoods that are in great need of revitalization. I know my brain is twisted that way, but it's true. Of course, you all know about the Lowell community and our pilot project. They're doing great. Uh, neighbors and property owners are working together. Crime rates are going down. Property values are coming up. People are investing again in this neighborhood. As we heard earlier, Steve Walter alone has invested in 36 homes in this neighborhood. That's quite remarkable. But the big question on all of our minds, of course, is can we scale this? Can we do this in other neighborhoods? Can we do it at the pace that we need to do it in order to see meaningful difference in these distressed neighborhoods? Well, recognizing the work that had already been done in the Lowell neighborhood, for example, Fresno was one of four cities in the nation this last year to be picked by a national foundation to participate in a program called the Building Neighborhoods Capacity Program. We call it BNCP. BNCP is helping the city and residents in southwest Fresno and in the El Dorado Park neighborhood take on a similar revitalization effort as what we've done in the Lowell neighborhood. It's all resident driven and the residents have prioritized education, employment, safety and housing for their priorities in their neighborhood. Even though this work is in its beginning stages, we've already seen some powerful examples of what can happen when a neighborhood starts working together. On April 23rd in El Dorado Park, a suspected gang member drove through the neighborhood and lobbed a Molotov cocktail into one of the apartment buildings catching it on fire. Instead of hanging back and just watching everything unfold without doing anything about it, resident leaders John Fitch Francesca Sandoval, Rosa Gonzalez, and others who were involved with BNCP took action. They quickly began to assemble blankets and clothing for the families who were displaced by the fire. They called all of the appropriate emergency response agencies. They called the Red Cross and they asked for help. They even started barbecuing in the middle of all the commotion and making food for the families and the children who were rendered homeless by this fire. You see, through BNCP, these residents had been trained that this was their neighborhood and that they were empowered to help take care of it. Now, there was, of course, a lot of media coverage of this incident, and when local reporters started doing their reports on the fire, the residents were a little shocked to hear one reporter after another do what reporters do. They go out to their live shot, they say where they are, and they begin making their report. Unfortunately, every reporter, when mentioning their location, reported that they were in Sin City. Well, that was a wake-up call to our BNCP resident leaders, to John and Francesca and Rosa and others in the neighborhood because, you see, the residents don't think of their neighborhood as Sin City anymore. They see the positive changes that are happening. John Finch, Rosa Gonzalez, many of our BNCP leaders are here today. I'm going to ask you guys to stand, take a look at their shirts. Notice. <laughs> on the front, it says leader. And on the back, it says not Sin City, but El Dorado neighborhood. Now, thank you. You may be seated. 
They asked me to pass along one request to you all here today. They said, if you're going to talk about our neighborhood mayor, would you please ask the community and the members of the media who are here today for your speech to stop calling us Sin City? We're the El Dorado Park neighborhood. So I think we can all agree that today the Sin City label is dead in the El Dorado Park neighborhood. It is no more. And from now on, we're going to honor the request of these neighborhood leaders to call their neighborhood by its true name. Well, now let's talk about our city's most famous neighborhood, downtown Fresno. No Swearingen administration state of the city address is complete without a downtown riff. Am I right? Thank you. So I want to tell you about this downtown. Let's pretend for a moment that this is a downtown in another city. And let's pretend that we're talking to a friend and this friend is talking about all the things that are happening in this particular city's downtown. And, and this friend is telling us that, gosh, there are nearly 500 additional housing units that are planned or in construction right now in this particular downtown. It's pretty impressive. And let's pretend that this friend is telling us that 14 of the 20 historic buildings along this city's main street are either fully occupied, they've got new buyers, or they've recently made improvements. And then there's this other great project going on of a 1920s historic building. It was formerly a theater, theater but it's today being converted to a cool mixed-use project. And this friend goes on and on and says, well, plans were just submitted in this particular city's downtown for a high-end restaurant and lounge on the 15th and 16th floors of the tallest building in Central California in this particular downtown. Oh, and by the way, plans have also been submitted for a new CVS store in this downtown on the most prominent corner, one of the most prominent corners in the area. And there's this great local music and entertainment entrepreneur who has a really well done music and entertainment club in this downtown and he's branching out and he's decided that he's going to do a four story building with ground floor retail and three stories of housing above. Oh, and also in this particular downtown, there is a downtown building owner that's developing the first ever Mexican Mong microbrewery. We think the first in the nation. And if you have evidence that there's another one out there, tell me, and I'll take it out of my talking points. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be the first. And I can't wait to taste Mexican Mong beer. Anyway. <laughs> and also happening in this downtown, there is another microbrewery that's already operating and producing great beer, I should say, this friend would say. Um, and that this company has purchased a new building also along the city's main street because they want to add a tasting room to their operations in downtown. Oh, and in this same downtown, just three days ago, a building that was propped up by stilts for like six or seven years that was on a major entryway in this downtown came down and is making way for a mixed-use, well-designed workforce housing development with 45 housing units and ground floor retail. And last but not least, your friend that's talking about their favorite downtown would say, oh, in this last year, that downtown had 163,000 people attend events in the downtown this last year on 113 different event days. They went to things like Suds in the City and Yellow Umbrella Tours and Over the Edge where people repelled down a building for crying out loud. They went to a Christmas parade and knew this year, like 30,000 of them went ice skating in downtown during the holidays. So what would you think about this downtown that your friend is telling you about? If it was me and I were hearing all of these things relayed to me, to be honest with you, my first reaction is I'd be very impressed by what's happening in this city's downtown. And then if I'm being perfectly candid, I would start getting a little jealous. And I would think to myself, gosh, why can't these things happen in my downtown? Well, thankfully, I don't have to be jealous of some other city's cool downtown progress because all of these things are happening right here in downtown Fresno. Those are not someone else's success stories. Those are our success stories. And my point is obvious. Our downtown is making its comeback. It is happening. It's not going to happen someday. 
It is happening. We need to change our minds as a community and see that just because some may still be cynical and believe that our downtown can't be saved, apparently that's not stopping our downtown from making a comeback. So please don't tell any of the 163,000 visitors to downtown this last year or the businesses or the property owners or the developers that they can't get anything good done in downtown because apparently they can and apparently they're making a pretty good go of it. Pardon my sarcasm. <laughs> Swinging for the fences. Fresno is becoming known as a place where things that were thought to be impossible are in fact becoming possibilities. No one makes this point about our city better than Carl Johnson. When Carl was a star basketball player for Los Angeles Harbor College, he never imagined that he would be homeless in Fresno 30 years later. Carl admits that he took the wrong path, one that landed him in prison for 11 years. He knew it would be difficult to find work, but for 80 days after his release, he tried to find a job before leaving Los Angeles. And then in January 2011, he jumped on a bus for Seattle to live with a friend and try to find work there. But on a layover in Fresno, he decided that this was the place for him and his fresh start. So he began by shining shoes downtown. And on a good day, he could earn about $30. But this was not enough to keep him off the streets, where he lived until Fresno First Steps Home and the Fresno Housing Authority placed him in an apartment in November of 2011. It wasn't long before Carl, who has the gift of gab, built up a strong clientele and a reputation as a hard worker. Today, he operates anytime shoe shine in the Patterson Building, and he credits his faith in God and Fresno for getting him off the streets. His can-do attitude comes naturally. Carl is the ninth of 16 children from Compton, and his family is one that is marked by success. His sibling, Dennis Johnson, was a five-time NBA All-Star Hall of Famer and an integral part of the Boston Celtics. Carl looks back and recognizes that his brother chose the right path. He did not. But Carl is back in the game. He's got a roof over his head, and thanks to a community that he credits for giving him a second chance. As Carl shines shoes downtown, he's bringing life back to what is meant to live. Yes, it may look like he's simply buffing out scuffs and polishing shoes, but ultimately, Carl is putting the shine back into his own 56-year-old life. He's proof that even the most difficult circumstances can be overcome, that it is never too late to put a life, a downtown, a city, back on track and headed towards its rightful destiny. Carl says, there is no reason you can't succeed here in Fresno with all the good people and all the good resources that are available. This is the power of a city that encourages people to face their challenges. I would like you all to meet Carl Johnson. Carl. Carl's story is a great one, and it's a reminder that we can't give up as a community on finding solutions to address homelessness. We still have a significant challenge on our hands with the downtown homeless encampments. Three years ago, at the State of the City Address, we launched Fresno First Steps Home, a nonprofit dedicated to raising private funds and then making grants to organizations that provide housing and other supportive services to the chronically homeless recognizing that getting people into housing dramatically reduces the cost of public services that has to be spent when folks are living on the streets. So back then, I challenged Fresnans to take the buck a month pledge, and many of you have done that and so much more. To date, we've raised nearly $800,000, and that's thanks to our individual donors, along with major donations from St. Agnes, Kaiser Permanente, PG&E, the Walmart Foundation, North Point Community Church, and many other sponsors. On behalf of the Board of Directors today, I'm pleased to announce that Fresno First Steps Home has approved a $435,000 grant to the Fresno Housing Authority to provide housing and supportive services to the individuals who are currently living in the downtown encampments. 
The Housing Authority will lead the charge in pulling together other social services agencies and nonprofits to meet the housing needs of those in the encampments. Between now and early fall, extensive outreach and work will be done to assess the needs of individuals living there and to find housing resources for as many as possible. The conditions in the encampments are extremely dangerous for those living there as well as for the surrounding residents and churches. So we need to move quickly. However, we must work hard to first make sure we provide housing for as many as possible. We want a win-win. Find permanent housing for people, provide supportive services that they need to help them stay in housing, and then work to keep the area clear and keep it clean once and for all. With the collaboration of the Fresno Housing Authority, Fresno First Steps Home, and a host of other community partners, we expect to accomplish all of these efforts by late fall of this year. Now, speaking of really difficult situations that we must find positive, proactive, attainable solutions to address, let's talk about the city's finances. First, let me quickly recap the situation because understanding the problem is half the battle. So many people have asked me, how do we get into the mess we're in? Well, it's really pretty simple. Revenues crashed after a tremendous increase in revenue levels over a five or six, seven year period of time. We experienced a 1930s-like crash in revenues. However, personnel expenses and debt obligations continued to rise. In other words, our expenses got locked in and pegged at a time when we had an all-time high level of revenue. Unfortunately, those revenues crashed, but we were left with the contracted expenses. To date, we've had to address about a $120 million budget shortfall. We've not addressed all of that. We're down to about the last six to $7 million. We've also had to deal with the negative fund balance situation, and negative fund balances are internal loans that were made to the general fund over many, many years, a long period of time, from other sources of funds in the city's treasury pool. Well, those have to get paid back. So we complicate the $120 million operating shortfall with a $36 million negative fund balance that has to be addressed. That is the reason for our credit rating downgrades. So what have we done to date to address the problem? Well, on the expense side, you've heard much about this. We've had to reduce our workforce. We're down 1,200 employees at this point. We've experienced furloughs, concessions, deferrals of benefits. We've done creative things like partner with nonprofits and churches and others who can help us take care of parks and take over operations of community centers so that the public doesn't experience a drop in service level, but the city doesn't have to pay for the expense. We've reduced and eliminated maintenance and replacement of equipment in the city. On the revenue side, there are several things that we've done. We franchised the commercial solid waste operation about a year and a half ago that generates revenue in the general fund. We created a commercial roll-off bin franchise. The PG&E gas service franchise fee was increased. We've increased building and planning fees, and we've done a, an audit, I'm sure many of you are not too happy about this, but we've done an audit of local businesses to make sure that businesses are paying their taxes. There have certainly been service impacts as a result of these cuts. We've seen a reduction in sidewalk repair, pothole street repair. We know that there are 3,000 street lights that are still out today, unless Steve has gotten a few more done since last I got my report. So maybe like 2,998, about there. Good. We have very few electricians and very few council members to make these repairs. <laughs> Our police department is down to 717 police officers from an all-time high of 848 police officers. The minimum daily staffing in our fire department is today at 67 firefighters during any given point in the day. That's down from 83, a 20% reduction. Just to put that in perspective, in 1955, our fire department had 68 firefighters per shift. So they actually had one more in 1955 than we do today. Obviously, these are not promising numbers. But as discouraging as our financial picture is, on February 28th, our city manager presented a five-year plan to the city council, and that five-year plan accomplishes three things. It allows us to pay off those negative fund balances within the next five years, which is recommended by our auditor. And we can't start building back our reserves until we first pay back those negative fund balances. 
it stops further reductions in our police and our fire departments, and it means that we will be able to start hiring back sworn personnel within the next two years. So it stops the bleeding and it begins to help our city make a turnaround. But this five-year plan has two major assumptions, and I'm going to share those with you briefly. First of all, we've got to pass Measure G on June 4th. We've got to do what 90% of California cities already do and let a private hauler collect the residential solid waste in our city and for the people of Fresno. Ratepayers save immediately 18%. Those rates stay low as they're capped in the contract. The community benefits because there will be no further declines in public safety service levels and it allows us to start resolving our budget problems. And then lastly, and I certainly understand that this is um, the, the place where the opposition is coming from and I'm sympathetic to the interests of our employees who are against this. I don't agree, but I'm certainly sympathetic with them. But if you put yourself in my shoes for just a moment and you consider what the options are, when it comes to making sure as many people have jobs as possible, every single worker with the city of Fresno affected by this decision gets a job in the private sector. Every single one. If we don't pass Measure G, we have two choices. We attrit further on police and fire, which I don't know about you, but I don't think that's a good idea, or we go do more layoffs. And the people who will be laid off will not have a job to go to. Mark and I sat with a group of employees a few weeks ago talking about our budget plans, and one of the employees looked at me and said, you know, I got laid off from City Hall in 2009 in the first round of budget cuts. I got hired back in 2011, but in 2009, when I got laid off, nobody gave me a job to go to. And I wish I could have had a $17 an hour job at that time because all I was finding was eight and $9 an hour jobs, no benefits, no retirement. And I think that employee sentiment perfectly captures what we're trying to make happen. I understand it means the conditions of the employees, their work conditions may change, but at least they have jobs. And to me, the interests of the community, balancing the budget, making sure we don't have any further cuts to police and fire, actually lowering people's rates and saving people money and guaranteeing that everybody has a job, I can't come up with anything better than that, you guys. I just can't do it. Measure G helps us accomplish all those things. The second major assumption in our five-year plan is that as employee contracts expire, we'll achieve some level of savings in our personnel expenses, and that we'll come to agreement with our employees on long-term financial issues like health care costs, retirement tiers, leave balances, all of those things. That will happen over time as contracts are open for negotiation. The bottom line is this. We do have a financial path forward in the city of Fresno. However, it is a very narrow one. A USA Today article reminds us of that reality today. When they released a story about the 10 cities in California that may declare bankruptcy, and Fresno was on that list. This is very real and this is very serious. We're the fifth largest city in California with 505,000 people and we're operating with no reserves. It is a very precarious position to be in to say the least. Right now, our only option for dealing with shock expenses or missed revenue projections is to lay off more people or to attrit more police and firefighters. Neither of those are good options. We must implement this five-year plan, and it starts with passing Measure G on June 4th. If we do, we can put this financial unrest behind us, and we can start the rebuilding process. Let me just bring this point home, and then I'm going to move on. I was speaking with a large industrial developer just two weeks ago, and he was giddy for the first time. I, I've, I've only known this person really since the recession, and every time you talk to a developer in the recession, obviously they're very concerned, and, and uh, this guy's not been happy for five years that I've known him. But this time was different. The conversation I was having with him, he's excited about the things that are starting to come his way. He says, I've, I'm planning to build another building. I've got some, some tenants coming in. I'm looking at major, major expansions for some businesses. And he was excited. And he said to me, unprompted by me, he said, but Mayor, we've got to keep this talk about Fresno going bankrupt out of the papers because that scares these guys off. 
I said to him, how about we pass Measure G on June 4th and we get that out of the papers so that you can recruit tenants here, so that businesses expand here, so that the economy grows, so that we can fuel what we need at City Hall for more services and, uh, and take care of the, the responsibilities we have as a city government. These two things are connected. I hear often from employees, they're so upset, so angry. Why aren't you doing anything about economic development? I say, are you kidding me? We're doing everything we can to attract businesses here. But guess what? An unstable city does not bode well in an economic development type of situation. But we can do something about that. And we've proposed a plan that will address that challenge. Now, it's time for me to close. I started this address by saying that our city remains strong and that we've chosen to be determined and persistent in the face of obstacles. Well, I want to close with a story of a nine-year-old boy. This nine-year-old boy loves to play baseball. He started playing when he was very little, and even at the age of four and five years old, people would always remark on what a great swing he had. He grew a little older, and he still had that great swing. There was only one problem. He couldn't hit the ball. <laughs> Whether machine pitch, coach pitch, kid pitch, always the same thing. Great swing and no contact with the ball. Well, the little boy starts to get discouraged. He can hear the sound of frustration in his coach's voices every time he goes up to the plate. He starts dreading every at-bat but he doesn't quit. He goes to every practice. He works hard. During the games, he dutifully steps into the box, takes up his stance, and executes that beautiful, perfect swing. And he strikes out every time. For two years, this goes on. The boy doesn't give up. His father is very encouraging and starts taking him to get some private coaching. One day, he's at the gym practicing, and a coach the boy and his father had never met yelled across the gym to the little boy. He says, hey, you're going to be a great power hitter. The boy's father turns around, startled by this declaration, and he thinks to himself, does this coach know who he's talking to? My son holds the record for the most number of strikeouts in the league. The coach approaches the boy and his father from across the gym, and he proceeds to tell the boy, you've got what it takes. You've got all the mechanics and a great swing. You've just got to know that you're going to be a great power hitter. And not only are you going to be a great hitter, but you're going to teach other kids someday how to be great hitters as well. Finally, someone sees the potential in this boy. The boy and the father start practicing with this coach. They put in extra hours with him. They work through the off-season, all through the fall, all through the winter. The boy and the father make extra practices with this coach in the rain and in the mud. The mother goes only once, but the father and the boy are there every week. They practice, practice, practice. Every time they meet the coach, the coach reminds him that he's going to be a great ball player. He tells the boy, swing hard. Every time, swing hard. Well, finally, it's time to start a new baseball season. The boy is picked in the Little League draft to play on a nine-year-old team. He's eager to start the new season, but doubts linger in his mind. All he had ever known when it came to baseball was failure. Would it be different this time? He had put in the work, but would it be different? Then. On March 23rd, 2013, on a beautiful Saturday morning in Fresno, California, everything changed for this little boy. Let's watch. At a boy, run, run, run!
Well, if you hadn't deduced it before seeing the video, the little boy is my son, Sam. And his father and the videographer slash cheerleader is my husband, Paul. <laughs> that was a three-run homer, by the way. <laughs> Can we really draw a parallel for our city from this story about a nine-year-old playing baseball? I believe we can and that the lessons are clear. Number one, hard work pays off. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to rebuilding and revitalizing our city. It's property by property, business by business, school by school, neighborhood by neighborhood, until suddenly momentum overtakes our hard work and persistence and determination and momentum like an ocean wave comes up underneath our work and begins to take us further, faster, and all of a sudden, it's not so hard anymore. I believe that we're nearing that point of momentum as a city. Number two, change your mind, not your swing. Nothing changed about my son's baseball swing before home run, after home run. Nothing changed, but his coach helped him to change his mind and see that he could be a great player. Well, in Fresno, I believe that our mechanics are good. When it comes to job creation, education, turning our neighborhoods around, getting our city back onto solid financial ground, we are doing the right stuff. But I do believe that we still struggle with mindset. The old tapes still play. Oh, we've tried that before, it's not gonna work. Now, those tapes don't play as much, and they are not as loud. And for that, I am truly grateful, but they are still there. Our IBM team that spent three weeks with us, who just left last week, pointed it out right away. They said, you guys don't realize what you've got going for you as a city. If you knew that business and government leaders around California are all chattering about the great progress that's happening in Fresno, would that change your mind about your city and what we're accomplishing together? Because they are. So let's change our minds about what's possible in Fresno. Number three, and last point, swing hard every time. To me, that is all about having courage and being willing to risk disappointment if things don't go the way you want them to go. I'll give you a quick example of this. Last year, some of you know that we were competing to have a regional office of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Mark Office. For the first time in the history of our country, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office said, we need to be out among the entrepreneurs, among the investors. We need to be more accessible as an agency. Let's open regional offices. And it was a huge beauty contest that thousands of cities competed in. Fresno went after it hard. Why just imagine having located in our downtown the office where every entrepreneur from all over the West Coast, every investor, every engineer, every scientist would come here to get information and to secure their intellectual property. It would be a huge boost for our innovation-driven economy. We swung hard, really hard. We put on a full court press, we had meetings, we had a great day for the site selectors when they came out. And you know what? Fresno was shortlisted. Among the thousands that submitted interest letters, Fresno made it to the shortlist. But we didn't get the location. Was I discouraged by that? Absolutely I was. I was very depressed for about three days. Would I do it all over again and risk that feeling of disappointment? Of course I would. Of course I would risk being disappointed again because I know that as a city, we're going to start hitting on some of these opportunities that are coming our way. And when you stop being cynical and you really start seeing the positive changes that are happening in our city and you know in your gut that we are going to see Fresno make a turnaround that we are going to become an economically vibrant, revitalized city with a viable city center, then you swing hard every time. That doesn't mean you hit the ball every time. But when you expect that you're going to hit the ball and that makes you swing hard, then your chances of making contact actually go up. That's how that works. That's what I believe our community is becoming known for, a community that embraces the hard work that we have in front of us, that changes our mind about our own city, 
refusing to listen to the old tapes, the cynicism of the past, and then swinging hard every time, even if it means risking disappointment when things don't go the way that we want them to go. We keep swinging with expectation that we are, in fact, going to smack that ball. Now, if we keep doing these things in our community day after day, month after month, year after year, Fresno will start knocking it out of the park, one after the other after the other. And I believe we'll look back on these times, the very challenging times of the 2010s, and we're going to say that it was all worth it because our city, Fresno, is worth it. Thank you. God bless you.